is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Global equities rally ahead of today's U.S. jobs report amid speculation that the Fed will hold off hiking rates this month while oil gains before this weekend's OPEC Plus meeting. The debt ceiling bill clears the Senate, removing the risk of a U.S. default. The measure now goes to President Biden for his signature. Plus, Bloomberg understands that Mehmet Shimshek will become the new Treasury and Finance Minister of Turkey as President Erdogan tries to shore up market confidence after elections. Now, first thing is first, so let's check on the markets. A lot of the focus, of course, is on the China tech rally. A lot of the focus is what we won't, uh, we understand, uh, have from the Fed, which is a Fed hike in June. All of that could change because of the U.S. jobs report later, but look out for uh, any change in treasuries and also some of the T-bills that are now really going whew, um, a sigh of relief after that debt default has been averted. European stocks gaining some tens of 8%. A lot of the focus is not only on the banks, but real estate futures in the U.S., three-tenths of 8% higher. It's really some of the driver that we're seeing, for example, with the tech in Asia that's filtering through optimism in Europe. And then Turkish lira, this is a Bloomberg scoop, a beautiful or important Bloomberg uh, scoop, that there is a market darling, Mr. Shimshek, that was finance minister about 10, 15 years ago uh, that could be appointed as soon as Saturday. And this would really give a bit of a sigh of relief to the markets, uh, thinking that Mr. Erdogan is less now market averse. So you can see Turkish there, 2088.04. Now, the Senate has passed legislation to suspend the U.S. debt ceiling and impose restraints on government spending, ending a drama that threatened a U.S. financial crisis. The measure now goes to President Biden for a signature, a move that's been welcomed by Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. This demanded a bipartisan solution. We knew we'd need to come together for a solution like the one that passed tonight. And so I'm happy to stand here passing this critical legislation to support our families, preserve vital programs, and most importantly, avoid catastrophic default. Well, after the vote, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had a message for lawmakers. She said, I continue to strongly believe that the full faith and credit of the United States must never be used as a bargaining chip. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ross Matheson with the very latest. So, Ross, what makes up the deal? Well, in its broadest sense, what it does, it takes it off the table through the U.S. electoral cycle next year. It caps spending for two years. Again, that takes it out of the electoral machine through the 2024 presidential election. We know it's going to cap spending. There are some specifics in terms of students will have to start repaying their loans again. There'll be restrictions on some services and benefits for poorer people, for example. And we know a pipeline's going to get through. But there's a lot we don't know. It has to now be discussed and argued further. And that sort of $64 billion potentially it has to be agreed um, in the near term and what does that mean that means certain services are going to have to be cut but that's going to be a really painful debate between ultra conservatives again in the republicans and the progressives in the democrats and they have to get that done by october so we're going to see more of the actual specifics come out now the broad deal's done but they've left a lot of the work on the table so Ross, i mean is this something that president biden can go and sell to the american people as a win as as we are in this election cycle well, he's going to start that tonight. He's going to have an address to the nation this evening where he's going to spell that out. Of course, he's got to sign the deal, which is really just a pro forma thing at the moment. But, of course, most American people are probably pretty tired of this and just relieved that it's done. It's really exposed, again, how polarised Washington is. A very messy disagreement. At least that's off the table now. So they're probably relieved about that. Of course... President Biden doesn't face any kind of serious challenge in the primaries. The left will line up behind him during the election. And this shows he can actually negotiate across the aisle. So that for him is a positive, potentially. Really, the danger, if anything, is for the Republican Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, who may face a rebellion in his own ranks next week. Yeah, not even Jimmy Dimon. I mean, that's a question mark, right? Everyone's that's kind of saying, is, is, is he running? Is he not? What party? Well, so he's going to run. He has to decide in the next couple of months. So let's see. Ross, thank you so much. As always, Ross Matheson, uh, they're looking at this very important uh, U.S. debt ceiling. Now, off the back of the debt ceiling, traders now turn their attention to the Fed's fight against inflation, whether there is a pause or hike in rates in June. Joining us for more is markets of, on markets is Chief Investment Strategist, iShares, EMEA, and BlackRock, Kareem Shadid. Kareem, thank you so much um, for joining. I mean, this is a big day, actually. I feel like it's the longest, and, and I've, a viewer just wrote in, it's like the longest four-day week yeah. uh, that he's ever experienced. 
in general, when you look at what the market is pricing in for, for June, d does it mean that we don't care as much as the jobs report today, or could it really change everything? So, you know, we, we should be on tender hooks. It definitely has felt like a long four-day week, but with all the data we've had to um, consume. So but <laughs> looking at the at the payrolls, I think you know the Fed's going to be looking at the participation rate and at the unemployment. If we see any budge there, any sign of of slack. But you're right. I mean, for June, it seems to be largely off off the table. The question is more around July and what they do after June. Is it a skip? Is it a halt? So what do you think will happen? Mm -hmm. And again, does it change what the market thinks the Fed does? In, in you know December or mm. even October, November, December in terms of cuts? I mean, the key thing for us is that the Fed is not going to cut this year. You know, re even if no. we see some sign of slack, that's what they want to see. Um, and even then, we still have a lot of pressure in wages in the labor market. Uh, macro data has been fairly resilient in the US in, in Q2. We expect them to want to see some sign of slowdown, some sign of slack come up in the labor market. and. The key thing is they don't react to it. They don't cut. No. But I, I mean, I, I guess what I struggle with is the fact that the market is very abrupt in thinking that mm -hmm. actually things are fine, things are not fine. Certainly yeah. the data from China has been very confusing. Some of the earnings data also from, mm -hmm. from shares has. So how do you see this playing out through the summer? Yeah, I think Q2 has been very interesting so far because we've seen uh, the market interpret uh, Europe and uh, EM, even China, somewhat in a Goldilocks scenario where um, inflation has started to fall, growth in Europe has been better than expected, and China starting to fall a little bit. So really, that Goldilocks trend, and it really comes through in the, in the ETF flows uh, uh, with investors buying a lot more European and EM equities than they have U.S. equities. So as we go into the summer, it's the evolution of that. Do do investors start? Does the market start to to, to anticipate that uh, the the uh, that Goldilocks trade yeah. in Europe and EM is over? Yeah. And do they start to apply that to the U.S. or is it more of a harder landing in the U.S. That's going to be key. And again, the difference I find surprised between what Europe is doing and what the U.S. is doing. So the U.S. in broader terms, mm -hmm. the economy seems very resilient, especially when you look at, the, at labor. Here in Europe, we're seeing cracks and actually we're seeing a lot of the ECB policy filtering through to inflation. Yeah. So is that because of the composition of the economies or mm -hmm. the U.S. is just doing much better? Yeah, so I think in Europe, we have had some help from the fall in the food and energy prices, yeah. which have always been a bigger component yeah. of the inflation piece. So you yeah. see that uh, yeah. fall from the headline. But when you dig deeper and look, looking at the core CPI yesterday, I was just looking at the breakdown of the numbers, uh, you know, a bit of a deeper look. We do have those pressures in Europe too. They might not appear at the, at the headline as much, but they are here. Look at the German wage data, for example, over the past couple of months. It's similar to the US story, maybe different drivers in terms of the tightness of the labor market. But certainly some pressure. So I wouldn't get too carried away with, with assuming that Europe is in a different spot on that. Okay, so what are you expecting from the ECB? Is it better to invest? And when you look at the flows, certainly mm -hmm. in you, you know, what, what you do and your iShares, yep. do you see a difference between actually investor appetite for Europe and the US? Yes, so looking back, there has been a big difference. Um, investors have been trading Europe like a Goldilocks trade, a lot more money coming mm -hmm. into European equities. That was helped by the China reopening for sure. You know, the, the consumer discretionary, the luxury names that we've been all following closely. They've, they've seen a lot of buying from ETF investors. Uh, whereas in the US, it's been more sluggish. Frankly, the flow picture in the US has been as concentrated as the rally. You know, the rally has been concentrated in tech, the flows as well. Um, but as we look forward, you know, looking at the, at the ECB, I think there is room for hawkish surprise there. Mm -hmm. um, there's the markets pricing a couple more hikes, but then it's starting to price cuts okay, later. That's interesting. So I don't think that would happen. And what do you do with China? The, the big unknown. One day it's doing great. The other yeah. one, we need you know a lot of support from policymakers. Yeah, and this short week has had a mix of both. We've had <laughs> bad and good data from uh, different uh, PMI releases in, in China. So it's definitely not been an easy one to 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 analyze. But I think with China, the key the th theme is that policymakers do have a bit of room to ease should they want to, because mm -hmm. deflation has been a key feature of the China reopening. And that's a key difference versus uh, developed markets, where inflation has been the feature of the reopening. Karim, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Chief Investment Strategist there, iShare, ZMEA, and BlackRock, Karim Shadid. Coming up, the return. Turkey's president brings back Mehmet Şimşek as finance minister, so we'll bring you the latest on that. And this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we're getting some breaking news out of Brookfield among some of the investors in early talks on SBB asset sales. Again, Brookfield has been definitely in the news because of uh, its acquisitive stance over the last couple of months, and I would say quarters. And at the moment, you can see SBB, the unpronounceable SBB. Our Joe Easton was telling us the story uh, just yesterday, gaining 24% on the back of it, as there is Brookfield interest uh, in early talks for some of the asset sales that SBB is trying to put in place. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that Turkey's president, uh, Mr. Erdogan, is set to announce Mehmet Şimşek as his new treasury and finance minister. Well, Bloomberg, Simon Demokan, joins us now from Istanbul. So, um, Simon, thank you for joining us once more. Does this suggest that President Erdogan is about to step back from calling all the shots on the economy? Hi, Francine. Well, that's too early to turn right now. However, what we do know about Mehmet Şimşek, of course, he used to be uh, Turkey's finance minister before, uh, is that investors they know him, they trust him, and they respect him for being the defender of orthodox monetary policies. Uh, he used to be a banker at Merrill Lynch. And, of course, President Erdogan really needs to improve market sentiment. And this is maybe exactly why Erdogan wants Shimshek back. Shimshek will be the finance and treasury minister. And investors will be looking to see if he signals quite early on whether he's going to have a policy pivot. For years now, encouraged by President Erdogan, Turkey has been following an unconventional economic policies, which includes low interest rates despite sky-high inflation, which is still in double digits. Late last year, it surged to a 24-year high. So Mami Şimşek uh, will replace uh, Nurettin Nebati, who uh, came into that role uh, late 2021. And of course, as I said, he'll be having Having to uh, send strong signals to investors pretty soon because they're looking for answers. They certainly are. So, what's been the market reaction so far, Sinan? Yeah, overall today, ever since Bloomberg broke the story that Shimshek will come back as finance minister, we've seen a positive market reaction. Uh, Borsa Istanbul is up more than 3% so far today. The banking index up uh, more than 6.5%. But, of course, the lira is still near record lows against the dollar. However, speculation over the past week that Shimshek would come back has paired some of his losses for the week but it's still trading above 20 per dollar. So what investors are really looking for is will Mehmet Shimshek signal a pivot in policy as well as re-establish uh, central bank independence and independence for economic policies without President Erdogan being too involved. Simon, thank you so much. Simon Demokan there with the very latest on Turkey. Now, oil inching higher, still on track for weekly decline. That's as OPEC and its allies prepare to meet in Vienna over the weekend. The oil cartel will discuss output and the state of the sector against the backdrop of global economic uncertainty. Let's get more now with Bloomberg's Manus Kranny, who's also heading to Austria. Manus, so first of all, good morning. What are the biggest risks as we look to the meeting? A lack of consensus. Not only is the China recovery faltering, but there's a lack of consensus and a lack of cohesion, I would say. There is so much oversupply from Russia, from Iran, and from Venezuela, those sanctioned nations. That supply is something that's getting very difficult to control. Russia was supposed to cut much more aggressively and faster in reaction to the sanctions. That hasn't happened. Here we are uh, on this road to Vienna, and I can tell you uh, that... There's a real vexation out there. The blame game has been that the speculators were responsible for taking oil down from the $90 range down to this $70 area. We've had a fairly tough week as well. The daily vicissitudes of the debt ceiling have not have not granted any pro risk in the oil market. But there's been three major attempts to perhaps control the narrative. 100,000 barrel cut in September when oil was at 92 million barrels, albeit a paper cut, that was in uh, the autumn. We were at 90 bucks, and then in April there was an uncodified or a, a, a voluntary cut of 1.2 million barrels. That's when we were at 80 bucks. And I should say that, you know, Saudi Arabia has done the heavy lifting. They have cut by 500,000 barrels, but it's the Russians who are not delivering at a pace uh, as perhaps 
the overall OPEC group want. The risk is, Francine, a lack of cohesion at the end of this weekend, uh, and that is a real material issue. Will the Russians cut more? There just doesn't seem to be that overarching desire to cut, but then, of course, You've got to build a consensus for that. We'll be on the ground uh, chasing ministers. We're already chasing them. The print team are there. I'll go tomorrow, and we'll have full reports on Monday morning. For any minister that fancies giving me a call right now, you're very welcome on TV outside OPEC headquarters at any time. Yeah, outside, but we actually, we, we know OPEC is excluding some reporters, so I also hope, Bannis, that they change Correct. their minds, and of course, Bloomberg will be allowed inside. We will give you the number, though. Everyone should call Manus and give us exclusive interviews on Manus Cranny. <laughs> They're on the ground in Vienna from this weekend. Coming up, South Africa said to be considering switching the location of the upcoming BRICS summit. It's facing a dilemma over an arrest uh, warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin. We'll bring you the story next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bloomberg has learned that Jamie Dimon is to visit Taiwan after wrapping up his high-profile trip to China. The stop-off by the J.P. Morgan CEO comes at a time of heightened tensions between Beijing and Washington. LVMH CEO Bernard Arthno, meanwhile, has become the latest big company boss to announce plans to visit China as Tesla CEO Elon Musk returns from his whirlwind tour of the country. Now, Rishi Sunak's administration has refused a demand from the UK's COVID-19 inquiry to hand over former Prime Minister Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages and pandemic diaries. The government's cabinet office says it's filing for a judicial review into the request for those documents. The move sets up a legal battle that risks amplifying accusations over a cover-up. Now, the Pentagon is to buy Starlink satellite communication terminals and services from Elon Musk's SpaceX for use by the Ukraine military. The U.S. has praised the role that the terminals have played in Kyiv's war efforts, seeing them as vital for the country's defense. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, sources have told Bloomberg that South Africa is considering switching the venue for an upcoming summit of BRICS leaders to another country. The move would resolve a dilemma over whether to execute an international arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. Well, Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja now joins us from Cape Town. So, Jen, good morning. Why is South Africa weighing moving the event and how serious is the consideration? Yeah, Fran, I mean, it really is a consideration at this point in time, because as you mentioned, uh, the arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin by the ICC has been causing a, a lot of concern and unnerving a lot of uh, domestic investors and also foreign investors, uh, because South Africa, as a signatory of the ICC, would have a duty to arrest him if he were to come. But still, what we're hearing from the foreign ministers here in South Africa, because they are here gathered in Cape Town is that the BRICS summit, the 15th BRICS summit, supposed to be held uh, in August, is going to go as planned in Johannesburg for what, um, for, as, for as far as we know at this point in time. And what we heard from the foreign minister yesterday is she's, she's really discussing and really reiterating South Africa's stance as a non-aligned state uh, and saying that the, the president is going to continue to explore legal options. But at this point in time, the country is still planning to hold this summit, uh, which could potentially uh, stir a lot of nerves uh, for a lot of people domestically and also globally, Fran. So, Jen, where is this block on potentially creating its own currency? So it's it's part of the top lines of the agenda here at the BRICS uh, Foreign Ministers Summit here. Today is the, the Friends of the BRICS Summit, and so we're going to see a lot of uh, foreign ministers from, from places that are looking to become a part of this bloc. Uh, think places like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and also Kazakhstan. Uh, but really what we heard on Thursday, the messaging that we heard, is they're really trying to create a, a bloc that is, is potentially shaped up for a rebalanced world uh, and can really exert their own influence. And so part of that has to do with this currency, as you mentioned. 
mentioned, uh, and what we heard our sources are saying, it could potentially uh, be a way for some of these countries to evade sanctions. One specific quote that really stuck out to me uh, was one of the foreign ministers saying that they expressed concern about unilateral economic coercive measures, such as sanctions, mm -hmm. threatening the developing world. And of course, you can infer that they're potentially talking about the U.S. Uh, and so right now at this stage, this, this currency uh, this, this debate discussion is really just at the proposal stage. But we've heard from a number of these foreign ministers just continuing to express their concern uh, about the dollar and about the dominance that uh, the dollar has had over their, their own nations yeah. at this point in time and really a trend that we're seeing globally. Jen, thanks so much. Jennifer Zabazaja there in Cape Town. Coming up, the market for AI avatars is forecast to ramp up rapidly. Our Tom McKenzie joins us next with help from his very own digital avatar. This is Bloomberg. Global equities rally ahead of today's U.S. jobs report amid speculation that the Fed will hold off hiking rates this month, oil gains before this weekend's OPEC plus meeting. The debt ceiling bill clears the Senate, removing the risk of a U.S. default. The measure now goes to President Biden for his signature. Plus, Bloomberg understands Mehmet Shimshek will become the new Treasury and Finance Minister of Turkey as President Erdogan tries to shore up market confidence after elections. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the AI frenzy is continuing to ramp up. Wall Street banks already use the technology, but it's growing fast in other business sectors, too, like media and e-learning. According to a forecast from Emergent Research, digital avatars could be worth more than $525 billion by the end of the decade. Well, let's bring in our very own Tom McKenzie with just a wonderful, wonderful, fun story. I mean, fun and also a little bit scary, Tom. Yeah. So you created your own avatar. Yeah, there's been a lot of focus and talk about AI, of course, generative AI. One part of that are these digital twins, digital avatars. So we went to a studio in East London, worked with a company called Synthesia. They're at the cutting edge of some of these videos and some of these digital avatars, and we got one made. So take a listen. Joining us now is a very special, slightly weird guest. It is, in fact, my own digital avatar, Tom McKenzie. Tom, digital Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here on Bloomberg TV. I am an AI-powered digital avatar designed to provide insights and information on a wide range of topics. OK, this is all very odd. All right, what, what exactly are avatars? Digital avatars, powered by generative AI, are virtual representations of individuals that can mimic human behavior, appearance, and interactions. They work by utilizing AI algorithms to analyze and learn from vast amounts of data, including facial expressions, gestures, and speech patterns. This enables them to generate realistic and responsive virtual characters. OK, so avatars aren't just gimmicks then, but what are the real world implications? I'm thinking across the economy, across different industries. What is the impact actually likely to be? They can revolutionize industries such as entertainment, gaming and virtual communication. Avatars have the power to enhance user experiences, enabling immersive virtual interactions and personalized content. They can facilitate remote collaboration, telepresence, and even assist with customer service. OK, there have to be some downsides, though. So what are the risks of this kind of technology? As AI becomes more pervasive, ethical concerns arise, including issues related to bias and fairness in AI algorithms, transparency and explainability of AI decision-making, data privacy and security, and the potential for AI to perpetuate existing social inequalities. Well, the, I mean, that was fun. Fun and, again, v very, very freaky. So what are some of the ethical concerns surrounding this? This is not deep yeah. fake, right, which we really need to, to put an accent on. Yeah, so Synthesia, the company we work with to create this, and then we got ChatGPT to give the responses. Synthesia define deep fakes as images and video that already exist that is then manipulated. They say they don't do deep fakes because they create it original. This is original content. I went in there, I recorded my voice, I recorded my image, and they built the algorithm, they built the digital avatar on the back of all of that data. But that is a key concern. You're absolutely right to flag that. We've had examples in countries like Venezuela, for example, of people using deep fakes to try and push their own political ends. Synthesia says, look, we've got the systems in place to try and 
avoid that kind of scenario. But, you know, night, work, kind of nightmare scenarios, you get a leader, president or a prime minister, the video is manipulated, they make some big decision. So that is a clear risk. And then, of course, job displacement. To what extent are they going to lose jobs? Synthesia are very clear. They don't want companies to be using video production teams. They want you to go to them, build the avatar. So there's a job loss there, clearly. But it's not hard to imagine that in a couple of years' time, companies, streaming companies, companies making films and TVs could be using digital avatars to replace actors. Yeah. So that's another area. And that's just when it comes to these digital twins. Generative AI, there's all sorts of questions about the music industry, arts, of course, and writers and script writers. So those are some of the concerns that are being flagged. But for a company like Synthesia, they, they've made about 15,000 videos. For the likes of WPP and Ocado, they're backed by a lot of money. For them, they see yeah. this as very profitable. The market itself seen as about $500 billion Yeah, by I think we, I mean, in the music industry is a huge concern because yeah. a lot of the musicians actually record vo you know, note by note and they, they did the synthetic AI-generated Drake. And so that blows up the business model completely. Yeah, the AI-generated Drake, yeah, raised a lot of eyebrows what? and got a lot of discussion within, within the music industry. So it's a live topic, absolutely. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Tom McKenzie there with his very own avatar, three Toms on set. It doesn't get better than that. Now, joining us for more on AI's Philly Felix Capital founder and investor, Frédéric Cour, Felix Capital's largest European VC in terms of assets under management to reach B Corp certification. Uh, thank you, Frédéric, for joining us. B Corp certification. I mean, I don't know whether that also warrants its own avatar, but you're certainly at the cutting edge of a lot of the things that you've been investing in terms of retail, in terms of e-commerce, in terms of how technology has changed the way that w we live and breathe. How will AI change that even further? So that's exactly the point. What we do at Felix is that we follow, um, we back founders uh, that are using technology to basically change the way we live, the way we work, the way we co communicate, the way we get entertained, etc. So with AI, it's a, it's like a whole new playground, basically, uh, and we expect a vast impact on, on our daily life. But I think a vast impact that uh, will be... Uh, uh, so strong that we, we will not see it, basically. It's going to be about uh, AI getting into our daily life without us seeing it. Like talking to someone, right now it looked a little bit odd, that kind of slow... The voice was a bit robotic. Yeah. So it's only the beginning. No, at some point you will be talking to someone, maybe uh, calling a brand, calling a business, uh, booking a hotel, talking to a machine uh, and having a great experience. Yeah. So this is only a question of time. But, so do you have, and I don't know whether I should ask you philosophical questions, but do, you know, should entrepreneurs, VCs, have, have a, a problem if a human like me cannot tell whether I'm speaking to another human or to an AI-generated avatar? So usually technology is ahead of both usage and regulation. So all of these things are going to come together. Look, we, you talked earlier about music. Remember when Nasper came and we thought it was the end of music. And, and look, you know, fast forward 15 years later, the music industry is all about streaming. So we expect that this is what's going to happen. Usage uh, and regulation are going to follow. And we'll, we definitely need to find the right ethical uh, uh, environment and, and, and for, for user I mean, technology. I feel like so downbeat. I'm not downbeat on AI at all. I just feel like it's the first time that you don't put human, you know, Napster means that I have better access to this as a human, whereas this you put technology before the human. What does it mean for your investments? Are you looking at places where it's disrupted or do you use it, for example, to find companies? Yeah, you, we use it, we, we see AI having a big impact on our activity at three levels. One, how we work, trying to be more efficient, uh, using technology, data, and uh, to, uh, to, you know, in a more efficient way, automating some of our interaction with companies, uh, that, that kind of things. Second, impacting the way our companies work. For in instance, we invest in a company called Travel Perk, which is a very large corporate travel business, which has got you know, over a thousand people in a call center. That's going to be um, vastly transformed and impacting the OPEX margin by using AI automating certain tasks. And then finally, what we do at Felix is all about creativity. Uh, so it's about changing the way we do things today, but also creating new habits. So in the same way that you know, the iPhone and smartphone uh, led us to Uber and Instagram, which have changed you know, huge industries, we expect AI to be a new platform and there'll be new things coming. We just don't know where they are yet. So do, do you find enough capital? Is there enough investment you know, coming to you that you can deploy and put capital, capital to work? Well, right now there is no, I mean, there is a lot of capital in the market. That capital 
at our end of the market is uh, being invested and deployed more slowly compared to the past couple of years during the pandemic. Because and that's of very recessionary healthy. recessionary risks? Or well, because, because I think it's uh, also we're back to meeting people in person. I think uh, real uh, valuations have been reset. Mm -hmm. um, in AI, though, we've seen a lot of frenzy. It's kind of mm -hmm. sometimes you, you think you know, people don't learn their lessons. Some of the valuations at, at the point where business models are not proven yet mm -hmm. um, are, seems way too high. At the same time, it reflects the scale of the opportunity. I mean, we should chart the conversations on Bloomberg. Like, you know, six months ago, it was all about the metaverse. Now it's all about AI. Well, but remember the metaverse. Remember the slightly awkward video of uh, you know, Zuckerberg explaining. I remember. Uh, and again, that was just the beginning, except that they didn't find a real usage. I think Web3, we talked a lot about it. It didn't translate into usage. What we see with ChatGPT today is the fastest uh, digital service to be adopted mm -hmm. online. That, that's very simple. I talked to my daughter yesterday, she was doing homework. Some of the questions that she was working on, she didn't generate them on, on, with AI, but she was kind of somehow powered by it. Yeah, I hope the teacher's not listening. Let's see. If, if the teacher's listening, please ignore well, it. But the teachers have to embrace it as well. Yeah. Um, but for the, I mean, I guess the, the question is that you have, so you were one of the early investors also in Goop and some of the, the you know, really mainstream things that we use every day. This is also through a search engine, so it's algorithms, you know, I type, I don't know, I need this, it's a, it's a, a cream or whatever. If AI takes over that and we have personal assistance, as, you know, an investor, do you need to think about how then they find your companies? So uh, if you, we back a lot of brands, for instance, and, and that's very much powered by you know, human creativity because a brand is a lot of something you need, yeah. but also something you don't need. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but we you know, Google at the moment, right? Yes, of course. So it's going to change the way we interact with technology. So you might just uh, go to a website and uh, you know, people are going to write, to learn how to write prompts like they do on uh, ChatGPT. It's going to be very different than uh, writing a search on Google. So it's going to change the way we interact with um, a service, probably make it smoother. Uh, and so we expect a lot of innovation in terms of uh, personalization, in terms of uh, finding the right product faster uh, and just leading to a better experience. Yeah, and I know you also focused, of course, on some of the sustainability play, which is why you bought a stake in, I think, in a French energy transition company called EFI. Is that going to be faster or slower than expected because of the war in Ukraine, the transition that we're going through um, into renewables? Uh, so that's a good question, obviously. The, you know, these um, uh, people are looking at their wallet uh, as price of energy go up. There's more an incentive to change the way uh, you know, your, your home is uh, uh, operating. Um, uh, solar energy, for instance, is a massive, uh, massive trend. So that's why we're back to company going after you know, installation of more solar, solar panels uh, in France and various other sustainability uh, 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 ways to have a more sustainable home. So you look at you know, AI, sustainability, there are two big themes yep. uh, with very, very strong tailwinds uh, where we want to get exposed for the next decade. Is there anything else that you're looking at? Yesterday we had you know, a half an hour special on, on the car industry in the UK and batteries. Is there still investment opportunities in the, these kind of things that will transform the way yeah, At, at Felix, we are more focused on usage. So we'll be more at the application layer than you know, the deep technology. Um, but obviously, you know, mobility is going to con continue to change. You know, AI is going to get into cars. Uh, people want to have a more sustainable life. Mm -hmm. So they, they are going to you know, embrace electric mobility faster. So we're looking at all of the implications at the consumer level, but also software uh, level. So you need to plan for... Um, uh, you know, solar panel ins installation for uh, battery recycling, uh, you know, this, this, this kind of thing. So there are lots of uh, new markets that are emerging. So we're in a world where you know, what's not changing is change. Um, yeah. you know, a year ago, AI was there, but was not yeah. in the public you know, and popular culture. It is here today. So that's very exciting for the future. Yeah, and the pace of change is so much quicker. Frédéric, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank that you for having Frédéric me. Frédéric Becourt, Felix Capital, founder and investor. We're just getting some breaking news out of Blackstone and Goldman actually leading a $1.6 billion deal for EQ, EQ2 um, take it's private. So this is one of the companies. It's pretty incredible, actually. We used to talk about M&A Monday because a lot of the deals that, that were announced uh, were on a Monday. Uh, today, I feel like it's M&A Friday. We also had uh, Blackstone being interested in certain assets that SPB was closing off. But Blackstone and Goldman together uh, trying to back a deal uh, and are now leading the $1.6 billion deal for EQ2 take private. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on that, and we'll see what that leads to in the coming days and weeks. Coming up, more pain ahead for Britain's housing market. We'll tell you why in a moment, and this is Bloomberg.
Economics, Finance, Politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the UK housing market is sputtering again, with economists predicting that the downturn has further to run. That's as rising interest rates bite into consumers' budgets, with data this week showing prices have resumed their decline. Let's bring in our UK correspondent, Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, uh, good morning. So, hopes of a recovery seem to be fairly short lived. Yes, well, we've had inflation shock after inflation shock, including for core inflation in the UK. So that's why traders are now pricing a peak rate of 5.5%, which is above the danger level that the Bank of England identified for mortgage distress, debt distress for mortgage borrowers. And that's just looking to the future. You've still got previous hikes yet to feed through. We were speaking to former Bank of England policymaker Michael Saunders on the UK Politics podcast this week, and he said it's the next few quarters where you'll see the worst pay for the housing market because the majority of mortgage borrowers in the UK are on fixed rates and the Bank of England estimates that only a third of the rate hikes that have already been done have passed through already. So this is that lag in monetary transmission that the doves on the MPC refer to. It's a blunt tool, the interest rate, the pain is slow and it's also for the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak difficult because the Conservatives of course have long made home ownership meant to be their dream. He's made his number one priority halving inflation by year end. If he can't do that, this pain in the housing market, the opposition will lay at his door. Yeah, Lloyds Banking Group is also going through some of, of course, the mortgages. I mean, there's, there are some of the smaller players that have also had to, to pull mortgages. I mean, it's just not a, a great time if interest rates are going to go up, but some of them are actually trying to, to buffer um, how much they can borrow and for how much. Yeah, you've seen about 800 deals being pulled from the market, according to Money Facts. So it has echoes of the Liz Trust era, if we can call it that, last year. You've also had lots of other data this week. So the Bank of England mortgage approvals data dropping unexpectedly this week, but also an unexpected rise, unprecedented, I think, uh, in how fast people are paying off their mortgages because they're afraid of what's in the pipeline. But you also saw in the nationwide data an unexpected drop in-house prices. It's only modest. It's not going to do much to help those people who are trying desperately to get on the housing market on the ladder after this decades-long boom, especially in London. But our economists at Bloomberg Economics reckon you're still going to get a double-digit drop compared to the peak from last year. So this correction has a way to go. Thank you so much. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest, of course, on houses and mortgages. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Goldman Sachs is warning of a sharp slowdown in its investment bank compared to the bumper gains a year ago. Its president, John Waldron, says the trading business is trending down more than 25 percent this quarter. Goldman is working on what would be its third round of job cuts in under a year. Now, Broadcom says artificial intelligence related sales will double this year, but that won't be enough to offset a broader post pandemic slowdown. CEO Hock Tan says AI-focused chip revenue may soon make up 25% of the company's sales. Total revenue is expected to rise less than 5% this quarter, Broadcom's slowest growth in years. The CEO of Palanta says new AI developments are so powerful that he isn't sure if they should even be offered to some customers. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, Alex Karp says he's wary about providing the tools to local law enforcement enforcement agencies for purpose such as surveillance. Usually we wait for we have to go out and find people. Now we have customers, especially in the US, just calling us every day. Wait, you said the demand is huge. Yeah. Can you quantify it in some well, way? Well, you know, um, usually again, usually, we've had a number of inbound calls in a year that we usually have in a year in like a month. We're offering things that are so powerful that in really, in reality, I'm not sure we should even sell this to some of our clients. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Coming up, hedge funds willing to pay a high price to hire the best traders. More on the increasing fight for talent next. And this is Bloomberg.
two pieces of news that could potentially actually lead to uh, some major M&A. First of all, SBB has attracted Brookfield interest in a, in a bid to rescue the landlord as it's selling off certain assets. And then the other one is Blackstone. Blackstone and Goldman leading a $1.6 billion deal for EQ2, EQ take private. Now also paid sabbaticals and huge signing bonuses are just some of the rewards that hedge funds are using to hire and retain top traders. In this costly war for talent it is clients who are footing the bill. This is the subject of today's Bloomberg Big Take. Well Nishant Kumar our hedge fund reporter joins us now. Nishant first of all congratulations it's our big take. I know you spent many many weeks working on this. So how is the talent war going? How ugly is it? It's it's very ugly, so it's leading. <laughs> it's it, millions. <laughs> yeah, in terms of money, but as well as uh, it's leading to conflicts between hedge funds, it's leading to litigations, it's leading to, uh, in one case, two firms basically uh, banning traders from actually leaving once they sign, sign on, otherwise they will be fined. So uh, that's how ugly it is. But in terms of compensation, yes, this is a big, big number. I haven't seen anything like this, and I've spoken to many industry uh, players who have seen this industry for more than three decades and they haven't seen anything like this. So why, why is it happening? I mean, wh where are we and is it just attracting the best? It's basically to try and attract the best talent for, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds. Absolutely. I mean, what is driving this is the real dearth of uh, quality, good quality talent that these hedge funds are looking at. Uh, essentially, in 2008 uh, and regulations after that, prop dust disappeared, and that used to be the training ground for these traders. But no, that supply uh, is no longer there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the talent, the good quality talent, experienced talent is getting circulated mm -hmm. within uh, a few large platforms. And th that's why, and at the same time, these platforms have grown multiple times. Mm -hmm multiple times in the sense that they have added tens of billions of dollars. So they need ever more traders to uh, manage that money and keep growing and keep earning higher and higher fees. Nishant, thank you so much. Again, our top red story today, hedge funds at war for top traders dangle $120 million payouts. Nishant, thank you so much, Nishant Kumar. And then, of course, we'll also push it out on social media so that everyone can have a good read of this wonderful, wonderful, important big take. Now, China is weighing some property market support uh, package to boost the economy. This really has been the question of the week on whether we saw some data that was disappointing and whether that meant that we had policymakers in China needing to step in to try and at least find a baseline or a floor for the economy. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Crisis averted. The debt ceiling bill clears the Senate, removing the risk of a U.S. default. The measure now goes to President Biden for his signature. Now attention turns to today's U.S. jobs report. The data may show a slowdown in the pace of hiring that could potentially allow the Fed to pause its tightening policy in June. And Broadcom predicts that sales tied to AI will double this year, though the chipmaker remains mired in a broader chip slowdown. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And Kriti, we are done then with the debt ceiling. That came and went. We're done with that through the House, through the Senate. But now we move on to the jobs report. Yeah, we really do. And it doesn't matter whether or not we get this relief rally when we are talking about potentially growth concerns at the end of the day. We go right back, snap right back into that inflationary story and what that means, uh, not just for the Federal Reserve, but central banks around the world. And look, you're already seeing a little bit of optimism baked into futures here that perhaps we might get a little bit of weakening in the payrolls numbers. But don't let the green on the screen fool you because even though futures are higher by about four tenths of one percent, a big part of the story is getting in on this kind of tech crazed rally. Essentially the idea that in the last couple of weeks uh, you have not only seen the kind of lack of breath, but essentially the idea that a handful of names are really seeing very, very few sellers on the market. Even any pullbacks, even like likes of what we saw yesterday, for example, not an enormous margin. So a lot 
lot of folks still kind of piling into the tech story and by extension the benchmarks as well and it's nevertheless four tenths back on that uh, futures contract higher again that may change as we get that payrolls data the two-year yield also of course in focus coming off the economic data 433 on the front end of the curve kind of unchanged right now but really interesting to see that it has to stay sustainably above four percent that just really reflects the idea that uh, the market is pricing in a Federal Reserve that is simply not done hiking, which is why you're seeing that front end of the curve really sell off. So important to keep an eye on that and how that changes when we get the data in just a few hours. And of course, with the yields coming or at least directionally moving lower, and you've seen that tick by tick overnight, the dollar is following down to the uh, tune of two tenths of one percent. Latest weakness coming in the dollar based off of what you're hearing over in China, simply the idea that they are weighing a property market support package to boost the economy. That is a really important story when we talk about Chinese growth and how that's reflected in assets like the commodities market, which brings me to NYMEX crude, a 71 handle there, Anna. We are seeing a little bit of green on the screen. And of course, like I said, I want to come back to the currency picture because see this latest tick for our radio audience, stick with me, that low tick lower, that weakness that you're seeing in the dollar relative to the offshore yuan coming off those China headlines. We are looking at 7.06 seven on that exchange rate, Anna. Yeah, interesting. If we had seen some uh, robustness in some parts of the Chinese economy, manufacturing and property were areas that people had concerns about. So that's an interesting uh, red headline to keep under review then, Chrissy. This is the picture in Europe. Uh, we see a positive picture really for equity markets here in Europe, maybe getting another uh, level of, uh, of positivity coming through from those Chinese headlines around the property market. But broadly speaking, it's been a positive start to the trading day here for European stocks. And we're looking ahead to the jobs report, but comforted by the news that we have on the debt ceiling coming out of the United States. Uh, make note of the a bright area of green down, down there in the corner of the map. That is, of course, the Turkish equity market. And we'll come to that just now. I'll show you where we are on the Istanbul market because we've had some really interesting reporting from our colleagues out of Istanbul suggesting that uh, Mehmet Semsek, who's somebody who was previously finance minister in Turkey and has been deputy prime minister in Turkey, could he be coming back to the top table, back to the cabinet under the president uh, Erdogan? Well, that's what our reporting suggests. We'll get confirmation of that or not over the weekend. But if that were to be the case, he is somebody who is known a very much a known quantity for markets and somebody with a much more conventional take on financial policy or monetary policy than some uh, of the other voices we hear from in Turkey. This is SBB. These are a couple of stories out of uh, well, that have a Scandinavian angle to them. This is SBB, the Swedish listed uh, real estate business. This is the poster child for the troubles that the real estate sector has been in over in Sweden. And now we understand that Brookfield, the Canadian investment business, might be interested in buying the company, talking to the company about that, taking on some of the assets. We don't know. It's still early days, but the stock up by 26 and a half percent as a result of the news flow surrounding that. And here's another story which has a Scandinavian element because EQT, the private equity business, is considering, uh, well, sorry, has made an offer for Decra Pharmaceuticals. This is a pharma company that makes uh, pharma products, not for people, but for pets. A lot of money in that, it would seem. Uh, but they recently put out a pro uh, profit warning and that had led some in the market to question whether we would see this deal come to pass. The stock is up by 8.3 percent. And you have WTI. I've got Brent, uh, Chrissy, as we just keep an eye on what's happening with this oil price as it edges higher, the closer we get to that OPEC plus meeting. Yes, yeah, certainly something we're going to be keeping an eye on throughout the weekend. But again, we are still waiting for that final seal of approval in Washington. The Senate passed legislation to suspend the U.S. debt ceiling and impose restraints on government spending through the 2024 election, averting a default. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer spoke of after the vote cleared Congress. This demanded a bipartisan solution. We knew we'd need to come together for a solution like the one that passed tonight. And so I'm happy to stand here passing this critical legislation to support our families, preserve vital programs, and most importantly, avoid catastrophic default. Joining us now to break it all down, Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson. Rosalind, can anything go wrong from here? Well, unlikely to, because, of course, it's passed uh, Congress, it's passed the Senate, just needs Biden's seal of approval. And, of course, he's going to address the nation later tonight in the U.S. to talk to the American public about what this deal means. And so, really, it is a done deal at this point. And what it does, most of all, is it takes the debt ceiling off the table for two years. That means through the U.S. electoral cycle in 2024, which is probably a big relief to everybody. So it's off the table for that. It caps spending for only two years, not ten. Uh, so, obviously, that also means it's off the table during the election cycle. But really, a lot of the deal is still unknown. We know there's going to be certain measures where students will have to start to repay 
their loans. We know there's going to be restrictions and perhaps cuts to some services for poorer people, but a lot of the detail still has to be worked out. And so the deal itself is fine, that's true, but really the reality is now we get down to the, the nitty-gritty on some of the deals, some of the spending areas that are going to have to be cut or trimmed. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office estimates you know, $64 billion has got to be found and pretty fast. That's a lot of money to find in the cupboard or behind the back of the couch. And so we can expect a lot of messiness going forward in the next couple of months because that has to be agreed also by October. Mm. Uh, Ros, how would you characterise what we've seen play out here around this debt ceiling uh, debate? Because we spend a lot of time talking about the bipartisan infighting that we see in Washington and we feared that perhaps some lawmakers might want their moment in the sun and make a big fuss and therefore push the US into some sort of default. That hasn't happened. Well, that's right. We always expected it would go down to the wire because it makes political sense for either side to do that. But did you want to be the one that drove the bus off the cliff mm. in the US? Probably not going into the election. And so there was always the incentive to find a deal at the last minute. But really, for the American people, probably looking to the comments from the president this evening, they're probably just relieved a deal has been done and it's off the table. And for them, obviously, seeing the nastiness and the infighting that you talk mm. about in Washington and the polarisation, like, could you just get a deal and let's move on? Because for them, really, it's about things like the job market. It's about their employment and their security. And we'll see that in the, in the jobs figures today. And it's really more for them probably about where the Federal Reserve is taking interest rates, whether those rates start to pause, as the market is now expecting. OK, Treasury markets will no doubt uh, adjust. We will mark our calendars, mark our diaries. December 2024, we'll get you back, Ros, to talk, um, talk about the same thing again. We'll be back to talking about the debt ceiling. Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson uh, to bring together those threads from Washington. Now, Broadcom says artificial intelligence-related sales will double this year, but that won't be enough to offset a broader post-pandemic slowdown. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Alex Webb with analysis. Alex, walk us through the Broadcom results then. Yeah, it was a fascinating set of numbers. The quarter's current quarter was broadly in line with analyst estimates. In fact, the outlook for the upcoming quarter was slightly ahead of estimates. But the full year numbers um, is only going to be about 5% growth. And when they talk about AI revenue doubling, it's doubling to $1 billion. This is for a company that has, you know, significantly more than that. It's not like a... Uh, a, a uh, NVIDIA, which has, you know, added 50% more revenue than expected from AI. This is really just some numbers around the edges. The, the full year then uh, they're, they're looking for now, um, I, my apologies, I'm just digging up the number. Yeah, so they're expecting 33, 35 billion for the full year. One billion as a percentage of that, clearly not all that substantial. And Alex, of course, that's the Broadcom story. Part of the Apple supply chain we should add as well. There's another major tech name reporting earnings, Dell Technologies, coming out, beating estimates, perhaps not enough to excite investors, though. Why is the stock down to the tune of 3.7% in the pre-market? Walk us through it. It looks very much like it's to do with the full year outlook, which uh, is sort of in line with analyst estimates. In fact, slightly below. They're looking at... Uh, you know, the low end of what analysts were expecting. That seems to have, you know, disappointed investors to a certain extent, even though the numbers in the current quarter were slightly better than had been expected. So it's really looking towards the full year. Of course, Dell benefited significantly during the pandemic as plenty of people and companies invested in more computing uh, tools. Dell was a beneficiary of that. That makes it quite hard point of comparison when we look into this year, into 2023. Alex, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Alex Webb with the latest on those tech themes. Let's move from tech to oil. OPEC Plus is meeting this weekend and it will be grappling with a divided oil market that's torn between a rebound in demand and recession fears. Joining us now here in London, Will Kennedy, Bloomberg's senior executive editor, editor for Energy and Commodities. Will, good morning to you. So the market has been soft for the last few weeks. Do we expect OPEC Plus to change policy at this meeting? They did it in April. It was a surprise then. They did it in October. Uh I think it's hard to say as of Friday morning. I think the meeting is um, up in the air to some extent. As uh, you said at the beginning, there are reasons uh, for OPEC to perhaps consider uh, steady as she goes or, or a further cut. The market is clearly uh, soft and has not gained any traction from that surprise cut in April. And I think that will be a concern to some members and may want to do, about it, on, do something about it. On the other hand, uh, there is still this expectation that the market will tighten in the second half of the year and that global inventories uh, will start to fall. And I think for any cut to take place, 
members will want to be reassured that Russia is going to participate. One of the issues is that it's not clear from the tanker tracking that we see that Russia has followed through on the half a million barrels a day cut that it pledged earlier in the year. And until that happens, I think some members will be reluctant to cut further. I've got to say, it is pretty cool that our oil team gets to track tankers uh, minute by minute. Uh, we, of course, uh, applaud that team as always. But, of course, the run-up to the meeting has been overshadowed by the bar of Bloomberg and other reporters being barred from the meeting. Will, talk to us about access when it comes to these developments. Well, as we wrote earlier in the week, uh, Bloomberg, cha uh, sorry, OPEC changed its uh, policy for press. Normally, you could just apply to be accredited to the meeting. Now they sent invitations to reporters, and uh, no Bloomberg reporter and no reporter from Reuters uh, and many reporters from the Wall Street Journal did not get those invitations. And at the moment, as of Friday morning, uh, we still haven't been invited and as such won't be, attend be able to uh, attend the meeting over the weekend. I mean... I think it's a great shame. Bloomberg has uh, covered OPEC for uh, 30 years, uh, Reuters for longer. Um, we want to be there, but we don't know why we're not. And we've asked uh, the Secretariat at OPEC to clarify the situation. Uh, they haven't yet been able to do that. Um, I don't think this is um, in line with their uh, stated mission to bring transparency to oil markets, but the ball is in their court. All I can say is the whole team will be there as usual, uh, covering the event as best we're able and bringing the news to all our readers and viewers. Well, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Will Kennedy then uh, as we look ahead to those OPEC uh, Plus meetings taking place at the weekend. Now, coming up on the programme, we'll get back to broader macro themes. We'll speak with Elliot Hentoff, State Street's head of macro policy research on the growing headwinds amid a uh, debt limit resolution. We're back to talking about high inflation, though. We're also counting down to the US jobs report. That's due at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Former Fed Governor Randy Krosner joins our special coverage uh, before and after that report hits the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, one of the big questions about this rally is whether or not it's sustainable. And, and the core of that question is if it's sustainable, why are we seeing such narrow breadth? Is this one of those times where the exception uh, may actually apply? And I want to bring a chart to your attention. For our radio audience, stick with me here. We are essentially looking at kind of sector performance in the S&P 500 and what has led to the rally. And we're looking all the way to the right side of this chart, which shows, again, extremely narrow breadth. We are seeing green on the screen, but it's only led by a handful of companies. And that's really different than what we've seen going back about the last 10 years or so. We don't see this kind of narrow breadth often match with these kinds of gains. But I have to say there's an argument that says, look, there is real money entering the technology space, the AI space. So perhaps that rule of breadth equaling sustainability doesn't necessarily matter for the bull market. Uh, that may or may not be true. Let's bring in a true expert, Denita Sakova, uh, our Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter what's your take on the story is breath needed for a sustainable rally yeah, of course, like we can see a very narrow breadth all over the sectors. We can see it if we compare growth and value, there has been incredible outperformance of growth uh, drawn by uh, quite a few stocks. Uh, you can see it in the S&P 500. If we compare equal weighted, uh, that kind of removes the value bias uh, versus uh, the original S&P. And then the gaps also are record. We're seeing the widest gaps in 30 years. Uh, whether this is sustainable, of course, a big part of it is, is IE optimism, but we have to remember that also we had better than expected earnings that lifted sentiment. Uh, we also had um, uh, a bias, defensive bias, and investors fleeing to safety, and some of those companies have strong balance sheets, so that's a big factor. Uh, and I think we're seeing is uh, there are big uh, inflows into stocks this week, latest mm -hmm. data by EPI, EPFR shows. So there is actually money coming into that rally. How far it will go, of course, there are a lot of factors, economy, Fed, so it's too early to say. But there is some uh, belief in investors 
uh, that this might be a, a good time, at least the last week, to put some money back into stocks. OK, so that's interesting on the breadth of, the, of what we're seeing. In terms of where the, the excitement comes from in technology, clearly AI, it was such a buzzword for a long time, and then we saw some actual bottom line impact of it uh, from the likes of NVIDIA. Um, this has created, obviously, a lot of buzz, but you say that some of the active managers didn't see this coming. What's the story there? Yeah, for sure. sure. Active managers were actually quite underweight um, te technology stocks, so they missed a lot of the rally um, and some people are attributing part of the rally because a lot of people were there was a heavy activity in calls so a lot of people were kind of chasing the rally and trying to catch up on this uh, I hype for the last week so that was um, you know that was also supporting uh, markets but we are actually seeing some uh, flows of, of, of people buying this week along with uh, c active manager catching up on what maybe they've mm. missed in the last few weeks uh, what, what's the overall mood in markets like then, Denisa, as we've seemed to have put to bed the concerns around the debt market, uh, the, the debt ceiling, sorry, in the US. We wait to see what exactly that means for the Treasury, for issuance, for corporates and for, for government. Um, and then, of course, we're moving into the jobs report. So very quickly, we'll be into digesting what all of that means for the, uh, the Fed in the month of June. What's the overall mood? Yeah, so if we look at, for example, the VIX or the zero-day options, markets are quite calm. Uh, VIX is below 16, which is really calm. Uh, going into a jobs day, the zero-day options is actually uh, the quietest we've seen it in a year. Uh, generally, positioning is uh, neutral. There hasn't been, uh, we're not, uh, investors haven't, there hasn't been big buying or selling in the last few weeks. Of course, we have that big jobs report coming today. We have inflation data coming on June 13th. So there are so many things that can change. Um, of course, we haven't seen a big rally after the debt ceiling. Uh, there are a lot of issues about liquidity, what happens after this big T-bill deluge uh, that we're probably going to see next week. So, um, you know, we're, we've, we've seen improvement in sentiment, but we haven't seen um, any actual actions because investors are perhaps liking for all those potential headwinds uh, mm. to maybe pass by. Denisa, thank you very much. Denisa Sakova joining us there from the Cross Asset team with a look at the markets. For more market analysis, you can find the Markets Live blog at MLIV Go. That's the function to use on the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Ukraine's air defense says 15 cruise missiles and at least 21 drones were shot down in the Kyiv region today. Ukraine's capital has been attacked by Russia from the air on each of the past six nights. No casualties were immediately reported after at least three people, including a child, were killed in Thursday's barrage. Meanwhile, drone attacks have been reported across a widening swath of Russia. Bloomberg has learned Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will tap Mehmet Simsek as his new Treasury and Finance Minister. Simsek is an advocate of conventional economics. Supporters say his appointment will likely shore up market confidence. Simsek is set to be in charge of all of Turkey's economic policies in the new cabinet. Erdogan won re-election on Sunday, extending his more than two decades in power. Jamie Dimon will visit Taiwan after wrapping up his high-profile trip to China. The stop-off by the J.P. Morgan CEO comes at a time of heightened tensions between Beijing and Washington. LVMH CEO Bernard Arnault, meanwhile, has become the latest big company boss to announce plans to visit China as Tesla CEO Elon Musk returns from his whirlwind tour of the country. Goldman Sachs is warning of a sharp slowdown in its investment bank compared to the bumper gains a year ago. Its president, John Waldron, says the trading business is trending down more than 25 percent this quarter. Goldman is working on what would be its third round of job cuts in under a year. A lot of movement in the financial industry, Anna, from job cuts to diversifying regionally. You can really see uh, a lot of the big players on global Wall Street really starting to feel the pinch. Yeah, a lot of interesting themes going on there. Interesting, you mentioned Jamie Dimon's trip to Taiwan, and we uh, understand other uh, leaders of U.S. businesses have made that visit. The boss of NVIDIA, very newsworthy these days, he was there not all that long ago. I was taken that by that Goldman Sachs story, though, because there's a contrast there, Chrissy, between what they were saying about the environment they see and Bank of America saying that, for them, the quarter appears to be flat-ish when it comes to those same markets. So we'll continue to watch the investment banking story, the fixed story, the equities trading story, and see how these trends 
themes develop through the quarter. Coming up on the program, we'll get back to the macro markets. Elliot Hentoff joins us, head of macro policy research at State Street Global Advisors. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Crisis averted. The debt ceiling bill clears the Senate, removing the risk of a U.S. default. The measure now goes to President Biden for his signature. Attention turning to today's U.S. jobs report. The data may show a slowdown in the pace of hiring that could potentially allow the Fed to pause its tightening policy in June. And Broadcom predicts that sales tied to AI will double this year, though the chipmaker remains mired in a broader slowdown. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot to digest there. We're kind of reverting back to those old concerns, inflation, uh, growth. I wonder which takes the cake in today's data. Yeah, absolutely. We'll certainly be focused on uh, the labor market later in terms of data, uh, won't we, Kriti, and what that means for the inflation story. More on that uh, labor market dynamic in a moment. Let's have a look at where we are on the European equity market story, then up by just over 1%. Relief at the passing of that debt deal through not just the House, but the Senate. Also, a little excitement, perhaps, about uh, the Chinese coming in to support the property market. That headline at the top of the hour, perhaps lending some extra support to European stocks and that market, uh, the, the European market, sorry, certainly doing pretty, uh, pretty well this Friday. The Turkish stock market doing well, as we hear. We understand, according to our colleagues reporting in Istanbul, uh, that we might see the return of somebody who used to be Deputy Prime Minister coming back into the Finance Ministry over in Turkey under President Erdogan. Uh, but uh, if Mehmet Semsek does come back, he's a known quantity to market, somebody with quite conventional views, a uh, former Wall Street banker, so somebody who the market knows and understands, and that is putting some positive momentum under China, uh, 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 Turkish stocks today. This is SBB, that long name we usually shorten to SBB, the property business over in Scandinavia, in Sweden. And we understand that Brookfield could be interested in coming in and buying up this business or buying parts of the portfolio of this property management company. And so the stock is up by 28.4%. Early stages, those talks. But talks have been taking place in London, we understand. Decra Pharmaceuticals, a pharma business critty, but not for you and I, it's for pets. Uh, but th this has been the subject of a takeover approach from EQT. And as a result, that stock up by 8.4%. I love that you mentioned the, the, the pets. Uh, Harvey, my puppy, will be very happy to hear that development. <laughs> uh, Anna, the stateside story is pretty similar to what you're hearing in Europe, especially when it comes to sentiment. Remember, the China story is absolutely playing a role uh, when it comes to the state story. Remember, after the global financial crisis, part of that global recovery was this massive investment and in stimulus from China. So really kind of incorporating that Chinese growth story, the idea uh, that the Chinese uh, Communist Party and the central uh, government might actually be able to prop up the Chinese growth story is a positive, even for S&P futures, which have been ticking higher, similar to what you're seeing in the European session, to the tune of about higher by five tenths of one percent. But I got to say, when it comes to the bond market and the FX market, it's likely to be all about that payrolls report that we are going to get in just about three hours. The two-year yield at about 434, hovering over there in a little bit of a wait and see approach because that payrolls data, Anna, is going to change the game when it comes to market pricing of what whether or not June is a pause, a skip, or potentially another hike. That's really the data point that we are waiting for and likely going to lead the story for the dollar as well, seeing some weakness in the green back down, about two-tenths of 1% in the opposite direction to the yield story, which is interesting. The ripple effect of that is going to be a little bit of a tailwind to the commodity space, despite those growth concerns that we are talking about. NYMEX true trading at a 71 handle, higher by almost 2%, also likely trading off, Anna, that Chinese story that we were talking about. OK, let's get to a macro conversation. Elliot Hentoff joins us, head of macro policy research at State Street Global Advisors. Elliot, really nice to speak to you this Friday and the perfect voice to have on on the day we, you know, the day after we've seen the debt deal pass through the Senate. So we're a little more certain that that, that is going to be a, 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 an issue avoided, you know, no US default. But what does that mean for Treasury markets? Because for some time now we've seen this sort of dislocation at the short end of the Treasury curve because of concerns around the debt ceiling. Now that's resolved. Now the Treasury goes out out and issues and investors pile back into that uh, that period so, so what is that going to do to liquidity in the markets and to, to broader market themes well the first thing that we could track is that on our be behavioral risk scorecard for institutional investors we've seen a slight kind of come back in terms of risk appetite so clearly the resolution of the debt ceiling uh, issue has has been positive for markets now, with regards to treasuries, there's obviously a massive issuance that's going to happen. That's always, that was always going to be the case, regardless of when the debt ceiling would be resolved. 
that the mechanics of that are that there's a net withdrawal of liquidity from the market. The question is, where does it come from? And that matters a lot. Does it come from bank reserves and basically further kind of inhibits and shrinks the banking sector's ability to lend and extend credit? Well, that would be macro quite negative for macro. Or does it come kind of from reserve repo facility where money is just sitting and being parked at the Fed anyhow? Then the macro impact is a little bit less. But nonetheless, it's a net liquidity withdrawal. And the important thing to remember is that in the first half of this year, the Treasury just depleted its cash pile. So some of the GDP figures are a little bit flattered by the fact that we basically had cash of the tune of 2% of GDP that was basically at no cost. It didn't have to be borrowed. It didn't have to be financed. It just mm. was depleted. Mm. Could it come from other parts of the bond market? Is that, is that a possibility? I mean, where, where, where do you think it's going to come from? What impact do you think it's going to have then, Elliot? Uh, I think it'll be a mix of all. Uh, some of it will come from abroad or it'll be foreign investors that actually decide to leave more money in the U.S. market than expected. So that in the short term is supportive of the dollar. Uh, but by and large, we think it's a mix. I think the, the more optimistic view is that a lot of it will come kind of, it'll just wander off from the repo facility at the Fed uh, and off into the Treasury bill market. But that's a, that's a benign view. Mm. All the, no matter what, net, net, it's, it's a negative. The question is, what's the magnitude? So, Elliot, that is the U.S. story. Let's talk about the China story here because it starts to feel like the narrative in the absence of kind of the debt drama uh, has really shifted to the growth story. How crucial or how underpriced is the China story right now when you're looking at European uh, and U.S. markets? Yeah, I, I'm a bit, a bit puzzled by this whole discussion around the disappointing macro data from China. We... The day China reopened in December, we had a forecast of GDP growth of around 5% for 2023. And six months later, we're happy with our forecast. We, it's unchanged. We think we're on track. We actually think the normalization is proceeding roughly along the lines of expectations. Our view was a little bit below market. And I think perhaps the markets got a little bit too excited that you'd have this highly accelerated reopening process the way you had it in, in Western Europe and the U.S., uh, obviously, China was always going to be a little bit different. Property is a structural weakness, so trend growth for years to come will be lower in China. But I think the important thing to remember is that this is a, just a slower process, so it may last a little bit longer. We have kind of 4.7% uh, growth penciled in for next year. Uh, again, lower than pre-COVID, but these are, these are decent numbers. We're, we're, we're kind of still confident on the China story. You're certainly in the camp of the growth is growth at the end of the day. A, a fair argument to be to be had. Elliot, what we love to have you on the show for is your kind of marriage of both policy and the markets. Uh, talk to us a little bit about whether or not this market should be even concerned about the geopolitics at play. Because even though it does feel like Beijing and Washington, for example, are perhaps at heads, you are seeing these headlines that Elon Musk, Bernard Arnault, Jamie Dimon, you name it, they are making trips to both Chiwan, uh, China and Taiwan, excuse me, uh, what do you make of that? How does that kind of compare and contrast with what you're hearing from your, from your clients? It's a bit paradoxical because in the, in the near term, our advice has been to ignore geopolitics. It's not market relevant probably for the most of this year. Uh, we're much more worried about next year where you, you actually have a variety of event risk that comes back. One is probably some type of peace process on the Ukraine war where China's role is pivotal and there's this negative spillover potential. There's the Taiwan presidential election, the U.S. presidential election. So we're worried about next year, but for the coming months, it's clear China's prioritizing normalization of the economy. The U.S. is trying to put in guardrails in terms of the U.S.-China relationship. And therefore, it's not a really a market story for the coming months. It will return in a big way because the long-term trajectory is clear. Uh, greater risk, greater spillovers into, into markets in, in a mm. negative way. Uh, we started this conversation talking about the U.S., and I'll pivot back there, if I can, around the Fed uh, thinking at the moment, Elliot. What is your thinking around June? Are you buying into this idea that we get a skip? It's a new word for a pause, apparently, but it means you go back to hiking afterwards. What's the, uh, what's the thinking for you? Uh, skips are very unusual in central banking. It's just not what central bankers typically do. We've only had one Fed hiking cycle ever where the skip became kind of a habit, and that was the last one in 2015. That's when deflation risk was kind of pronounced uh, post-financial crisis and um, otherwise. The reality of skip is actually rather unlikely. You know, if, if there is that pause, it probably means that we hit peak Fed. Uh, again, back to the Treasury bill issuance, you, you're going to have some liquidity conditions deteriorate over the summer. So it's hard to make the case that 
why would you hike in July when kind of a lot of the liquidity headwinds make themselves felt when you're not doing it in June? Okay, Elliot, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. Good to speak to you today. Elliot Hentoff of State Street Global Advisors. Coming up on the program, riding the AI wave, we will hear from the CEO of the software developer C3 AI and take a look at the growing interest in AI-powered avatars. This is Bing Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Let's turn back to the AI frenzy that's been fueling the tech sector. One of the biggest players in this space is software developer C3 AI. The company CEO spoke on Bloomberg yesterday. He says the AI rally, it's not overdone. Well, looking at the big picture, when you see the people who are making the semiconductors that are running these AI applications announce that they're increasing, almost doubling production, in the case of NVIDIA, I think from $7 billion in chips to $11 billion in chips in one quarter. I mean, this is unprecedented, I think, in the history of the semiconductor industry. And so I think that's proof positive that this AI phenomenon is uh, very real, just in the amount of, you know, uh, CPU consumption that we're utilizing. Well, let's talk about your company specifically and your earnings. Your revenue forecasts were seen as disappointing, uh, but you note in your own earnings as well that you've got a limited list of clients, in particular a reliance on deals in the energy space, companies that use your software to analyze huge amounts of data. Outside of energy and defense companies, who are you getting calls from right now? Well, if we look at our um, the industries in which we did business last year, we did about 33% in oil and gas, almost 29% in defense and intelligence, 13% in high tech, 11 in energy utilities, 5% in each in manufacturing, food processing, chemicals, life sciences. So it's getting increasingly diverse. That was the CEO of the software developer C3 AI. Let's stick with the AI theme. As the generative AI frenzy continues to ramp up, its applications in media, e-learning and communications are drawing new interest. The digital avatars market is growing fast and is expected to top $525 billion by the end of the decade. Tom McKenzie, our colleague here at Bloomberg, spoke about this with his, yes, this is, this is real, very own digital twin. <laughs> they can revolutionise industries such as entertainment, gaming and virtual communication. Avatars have the power to enhance user experiences, enabling immersive virtual interactions and personalized content. They can facilitate remote collaboration, telepresence, and even assist with customer service. Well, this just got a whole lot of weird because uh, that was Tom talking to Tom and Tom just joins us now here in London on set. <laughs> this is the real Tom, the Tom McKenzie that I prefer as opposed to the, uh, the slightly stilted avatar version. Uh, Tom, tell us about the process then of creating an AI powered yeah. avatar and then talking to yourself. So there's obviously a lot of threads to the AI story and one area that we wanted to explore and understand better partly for self-interest reasons, is <laughs> digital avatars and digital twins. So we work with a company called Synthesia. They're at the leading edge of generating these digital avatars. We went into a studio in East London. I recorded some voice tracks, a lot of voice tracks. Some of the language were very strange and stood in front of the camera and did some movements because, of course, they want to be able to put all of that data into their AI-powered algorithm to build out this avatar. It took a bit of time to process all of it, but the deal is, once you've got this avatar, you can get it to basically say whatever you want it to say to. We used ChatGPT for these answers. So we went to ChatGPT, asked some questions to ChatGPT, we took that text, put it in the avatar, and those are the responses that you're hearing. So that's a bit of the background behind how we produce this. Put some numbers on it for us, Tom. I mean, that looks like yeah. a lot of fun, but why would someone actively invest in this? Yeah, so the business case is this. And Synthesia, they work with about 15,000 clients, they say, including the likes of WPP, Ocado, McDonald's, Amazon. And the case that they have is a lot of this is used for internal communications for some of these big companies. So you can imagine the CEO or an executive, he or she wants to put out a message across their global teams. They generate and build out an avatar and then they can get the avatar of themselves to generate and deliver that message, whether it's in Spain or China or back in the US, because they have about 120 different languages that they can program around this. Top line, according to some research, this could be an industry, this could be a particular sector, digital avatars, worth about $530 billion 
just by 2030. What Synthesia say is it reduces the cost. You don't have to spend all that money on camera teams and audio and all the rest of it, editing. You do it once, costs about $1,000, and then you can reuse your own avatar for delivering those internal comms messages. But you can imagine that the door is open now to much wider use as well. Yeah, I mean, I can see the attraction, but you also have to wonder how the message lands, I suppose. If you don't send the CEO, you yeah. send the CEO's avatar. I wonder how the messaging comes across. What are some of the ethical concerns then and the risks surrounding this? Well, they're numerous. They are, they are numerous. And, you know, look, I actually put that question to my own digital swim, my own avatar on the risks, some of the ethical concerns. So take a listen to what I or it had to say. Ethical concerns arise, including issues related to bias and fairness in AI algorithms, transparency and explainability of AI decision-making, data privacy and security, and the potential for AI to perpetuate existing social inequalities. Okay, so some examples there given by my own digital twin about some of the risks. Talking about generative AI in general and across the board, in terms of the concerns about data, data quality, whether it embeds biases, gender biases, race biases, the question of fairness, the fact that ChatGPT and other platforms sometimes produce what are called uh, illusions or hallucinations. Basically, they get things wrong. Yeah. When it comes to these digital avatars, concerns about deep fakes. So you could get a digital avatar of the president of the US, for example, delivering a message that he or she wouldn't be delivering. So that's a concern. And then the replacement of jobs. And I actually asked myself whether we were going to be replaced. And they said, don't worry, TV Please anchors are safe okay. because we have charisma. So that's clearly true for you, Anna, Amazing. and Pretty. There's still a big question mark over me. <laughs> well, I still prefer the real Tom to the digital well, one. So you. I think we're safe. I think we're safe there. Tom McKenzie, thank you very much. Uh, Tom McKenzie with the latest uh, on those uh, slightly surreal AI developments, talking to himself. Now, coming up, the countdown to the US jobs report. More on that. Uh, and what we expect, we will talk to who else? Mike McKee. He brings the charisma. This is Bling Beck. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, we get the U.S. jobs report today in just a few hours, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. The data could show a slowdown in the pace of hiring. Joining us now is Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Well, could show the, down, the, the slowdown, could. but and that's the hope that it's going to from, yeah. from the markets. Are, are we going to get there? Well, it's all relative, of course, because when we're talking about 195,000 jobs is the forecast, that is still a significant number. Yeah. And it is far above the number that uh, economists say you need to fill the replacements, uh, all the people who come into the labor force each month. So we'll see whether we go down or not. Unemployment expected to tick up just a little bit. And we are going to be watching average hourly earnings because the Fed's going to be watching average hourly earnings. But I tell you, Critty, if you're a momentum trader and you had 13 up days in a row on a stock, you might want to buy into it. Yeah. We've had 13 up months on non-farm payrolls. For 13 months in a row, payrolls have come in higher than the Bloomberg consensus. And so uh, maybe you want to think uh, that is a, a good bet today. The whisper number on Wall Street, according to uh, Bloomberg's whisper function, is 226. So uh, Wall Street leaning mm. towards the idea that we're going to get a 14th month in a row. Okay. Whisk go, I think. WHIS, isn't it? The function to find those, Mike. Yeah, incredible yep. run then for that payrolls number. How much weakness do we need to see in the jobs market? Uh, not that anybody uh, in an abstract sense wants to see weakness, but how much will we need to see or is the Fed thinking we need to see to tr weigh down on inflation? Well, they'd like to see the unemployment rate start to rise and uh, suggesting that the labor market is cooling. And at the same time, you might see average hour earnings grow a little bit more slowly. And that's their goal. We're running at a 4.4 percent average uh, rate each month, uh, annual average. And they'd like to get that down to three to three and a half percent. But the numbers that have been coming in lately have just shown us very uh, strong labor market remains. We had that jolts report that the Fed relies on come in over 10 million again. And and, of course, uh, ADP this week, e even the ISM manufacturing numbers came in stronger than expected for employment. So it looks like uh, the odds are still stacked against the Fed getting what it wants out of the labor market. Which brings us to the whole concept of a pause, a skip, uh, a gallop, if you will, uh, from, from the Federal Reserve. 
Is this one data point really going to make a difference? Doesn't Chairman Powell love to say, look, we are not data or we are data dependent. One data point isn't enough uh, to make a call. Well, the speakers that we have heard from lately, including the presumptive vice chair, he hasn't been confirmed yet, Philip Jefferson, suggest that this data point isn't going to matter, that they still think that they can do a at least a skip, not raise in June, and then maybe do it in July if they need to. But if it comes in very strong, especially if wages start to rise, then that could push against that idea. And then, of course, we get the CPI the day before the Fed decision. So uh, today's number and the CPI number will tell us what the Fed is likely to do. Certainly a lot to digest and going to be the major macro market mover this morning. Michael McKee, our international economics and policy correspondent. We thank you as always. So that's the macro. Let's look at the micro here. We are watching a few of these stocks in the pre-market. Remember, earnings season still kind of trickling out. Lululemon at the top of that story, higher by about 15% in the pre-market. Their earnings beating estimates that higher income consumers still buying at leisure. And that is really feeding into their bottom line. So that is good news over at that company. But from retail, let's go to the tech sector. MongoDB, for example, surging on that boost in their EPS forecast. Again, a major tech name mm -hmm. here, higher by about 26 percent. Uh, and you are seeing them actually beat their estimates as well. Broadcom is going to be a really interesting story, though, especially when we're talking about this wider slowdown. Those gains, though, overshadowed by the sales slowdown that you're seeing, despite them actually coming out with some good numbers. The shares taking a hit down about 2 percent. Uh, Anna, and then of course Dell Technologies, one of those old guard tech names. Those results are suggesting perhaps there's a bottom in PC sales, but they're not seeing that momentum, that business investment that you would expect. Those shares again down just about 3.7 percent in the pre-market. So a little bit of pain in a little bit of sectors. Yeah, it's really interesting to watch how this uh, the AI boom is spreading and perhaps limited in some parts of the tech world. So some areas of tech benefiting from it and others, yes, benefiting, but also feeling the headwinds from the broader tech, uh, broader chip story that we're seeing globally uh, around Chinese growth, perhaps. Now, that is it for early edition then, Critty. Surveillance is, of course, ahead. Uh, they'll be speaking with Nadia Lovell of UBS, Randy Krosner of the uh, Chicago uh, University of Chicago, and Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock, all joining the team. Lots to discuss as the team gets you ready for that jobs report. Uh, look for that coming uh, a little bit later on uh, today. They'll get you through those numbers and be considering what all of the data means for the Fed, of course. This is Bloomberg.